Okay, so we'll make a start. Um, my name is Jan Strugnell and I'm the Director for the Centre for Sustainable Tropical Fisheries and Aquaculture, which is the CSTFA, and I'd like to welcome you to our seminar series. So the CSTFA is a research provider for sustainable tropical fisheries and aquaculture research globally. We provide world-class multidisciplinary solutions focused research for Australian and international resource managers, both in government and the private sector. And I realise we have many international uh, participants joining us today. So I want to let you know uh, that we're based at James Cook University uh, in Townsville in far north Queensland, uh, which is in Australia. And I encourage you to check out our website to find out more about the CSTFA or send me an email if you like. So today it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Andy Shin to speak to us. Andy is the Director of Benchmark R&D and is based in Th Thailand, where he oversees its veterinary service, diagnostic laboratory, research aquaria and disease challenge facilities. Andy's passionate about aquatic animal health, especially parasites and methods for their rapid, confident identification and detection, their taxonomy, their management and control. And today, Andy will speak to us about disease in aquaculture and in particular, recording disease losses. And he will introduce the subject by providing some estimates for some of the top 100, 100 health conditions impacting on uh, global aquaculture production, starting with a focus on three of the most economically valuable industries, white shrimp, Atlantic salmon and tilapia. So we welcome Andy and thank him very much for his time. If you have some questions, please uh, um, add them to the Q&A and um, Andy will answer those at the end of the seminar. Um, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you, thank you, Jan. Thank you very much for that very kind uh, invitation. Um, as you can see, I've already changed the title um, a little bit because just purely because of time. Uh, so instead of talking about the top 100 diseases, I'm going to just focus on the top 40. Um, just as the title slide uh, scrolls past, this is, this is how I kind of think about disease. I always think about um, an attack from a variety of different pathogens. So over the course of the next 40 minutes, I'm going to try and uh, uh, give you a flavor of some of the things that I've been working on with regard to diseases in aquaculture. So I suppose I should start really with an introduction about myself and, and really to say, how did I first get into diagnostics? Well, for me, it began as a five-year-old boy. Uh, this, this, is, this is me. And like most small, small boys, I had a stick. And I lived on a pig farm. And with my stick, I had a habit of uh, poking dead animals and things uh, coming out of these animals. And as I poked around in their poo and these sorts of things, I saw a variety of different parasites and nematodes, and this really got me quite passionate about parasitology because I'm a parasitologist. So at this point, I suppose I should also introduce you to my family. Not my family family, but really my parasite family, or at least those parasites to which I've played uh, a host to. Um, you can just see some of them here on screen. So um, you can see I've had uh, head lice, eyelash mites, um, you can see a very nice video playing in the middle there of some nematodes um, of a human infection. I should point out that this is not a home video. That would just be plain weird. Um, but you can also see that I've had uh, leeches. And because of living on a farm and living in Wellington boots, I've picked up a variety of athlete's foot. And of course, working in wet environments um, in fish ponds, obviously picked up things like leeches. So what did all of this teach me? Well, First of all, it taught me about the importance of washing your hands. And of course, this taught me the importance of chemotherapy and sanitary measures. It also taught me don't bite your fingernails. It's an easy way of contracting infections. And this taught me the importance of food safety, uh, food and water safety. And of course, the third most important uh, lesson I learned about living on the farm was biosecurity and be careful where you, where you step because it's very easy to spread, shall we say, um, different infections or waste products around if you're not careful on site. So these three very important lessons as a young boy really taught me how infection actually affects me. As I said, I lived on a pig farm. And just to give you um, a story about my life on the farm, um, 
in about 1983 to 1985, there was a huge outbreak of Algeski's disease. This is pseudo pseudo rabies. It's a virus that's spread by, by air, can travel up to 70 kilometers in a day. And over 500 or 500 farms were, were affected in the UK. And at 71 of those farms, there was a compulsory slaughter of pigs. It caused pigs to have respiratory um, distress. The um, sows used to abort. Um, and there was a, a variety of other problems, convulsions, these sorts of things. So um, 71%, uh, 71 of those farms, as I said, the stock was destroyed by the government. This circle here, this was actually our farm. And you can see that actually we were one of the last farms to be affected by Algeskis. And all the stock on our farm were actually slaughtered. So this was quite a serious lesson for us because um, we weren't the owners of the farm, we were stockmen. So no livelihood meant no home. I should point out, this is not actually the picture of me and my family. It was a, it was a few more, uh, more recent years ago than this. But of course, this really taught us how um, impacts of different animal diseases can actually have impacts on families and in shaping their lives. So after the farm unfortunately closed, um, I moved away consequentially to university. And there I got very interested into parasites. I learned about um, a particular parasite. You can see the video here in the top right hand corner. This is Gyrodactylus. This is a, a small uh, monogenian fluke. It's an OIE notifiable pathogen, which has caused huge problems in Norway. And what it does is just by um, attaching its hooks into the surface of the skin, feeding away, it causes Dos, uh, dis, um, osmotic disruption to the skin. And unfortunately, it results in uh, huge mortalities of young, uh, young salmon. Unfortunately, um, many sa uh, salmon rivers in Norway were decimated um, and they've had to use some quite serious treatments to remove all, of, all the salmon and the parasite with it and start again. So again, this was a very important lesson. And this taught me how pathogens can actually have impacts on, a, in, on an entire country. Okay, so now we perhaps we should start launching into today's talk. And of course, it's always quite usual to start, start off with a statement about aquaculture. And you've, you've probably seen this many times before, that we, but we know that aquaculture has a very long history. We know that the Chinese were doing it perhaps three and a half thousand um, years before Christ. And then a little later on, so were the Egypt, Egyptians. And it's quite interesting because when you look into some of these Egyptian tombs, and here we're looking at um, uh, one of the panels from, from the tomb of uh, Nibbermann, and here you can see he's out fishing. And I was quite interested when I saw this picture, because if you look at this, this large fish at the bottom here with its large swollen belly, perhaps this is a little fanciful, but this perhaps reminds me of this. This is a Nile tilapia with a streptococcus infection again, with a very swollen belly full of ascites. And so very fancifully, I like to think that for as long as we've been growing fish, we've also had to try and deal with their diseases. Okay, so now let's launch into some of those sort of typical kind of aquaculture graphs that you've seen. We know aquaculture is growing well. If we look at the projected figures, probably by the end of this year, we should be producing close to 129 million tons. Um, of course, the figures from FAO have just been released, so please don't take too close a detail on these, the breakdown of the fish, the, the, the plants, the mollusks and the crustaceans on the side here. I just need to revise those figures just a, just a wee bit. But if you look at these figures, first of all in red, this shows aquaculture production every 10 years. And then the figures in yellow show by how much the actual aquaculture uh, production is increasing. So we can see for us at the moment, we only have comprehensive figures up until 2017. And we're already about 1.44 times greater production than we produced in 2010. And if things continue to, to, to go the way we are, we should have an aquaculture increase of around 1.66. So the industry is looking is looking pretty good. But of course, we need some very careful interpretation of some of these figures. So again, here we have our aquaculture production. But if we start to put on some of the other industries, say things like chickens, pigs, 
egg production, cattle, uh, lamb, sheep. Um, and then if we forward those to 2025, if we look forward to see what's happening in the next 25 years, then if we believe the figures, it would suggest that aquaculture production is going to take over some of these other mainland uh, agricultural industries. Um, we know that aquaculture is currently producing at around, um, increasing at around 4.9% year on year. But if we put on some of the other industries and just pop those figures along the side there, we do need to be very careful in how we interpret the figures for aquaculture because we must think about the edible portion. A large part of production is plants, and of course we, we eat the whole part of the plant that's produced. But if we think about um, the waste products from the rest of aquaculture, from the shell, from the carcass, um, even if we assume a very generous 80% is an edible portion, then we're probably at around this point. So in actual fact, aquaculture production probably won't overtake chickens in the next five years. In an actual fact, to be more realistic, we know that when we fillet fish, we're probably only getting around between 35 to maybe 50%, depending on the fish species. So really we have to move those two red crosses further to the left. So we still have quite a way to go before we overtake some of those main agricultural industries. And I think it's always important that we think about this when we interpret some of these figures. Of course, as an aquaculture industry, I think we've been pretty successful. When you look at um, the figures provided by FAO, it would suggest that uh, we've pr perhaps over the last 70 years, we've explored the culture of, of over 600 species of aquatic animal or plant or mollusk or crustacean. And we're still producing or still growing around 496 species of those. So at least 80% of the species that we've explored, we're still continuing to, to grow and derive product from. Of course, when you look at the FAO statistics, they do have some categories which include very generalized categories, things like um, marine fish, freshwater fish, um, which is uh, perhaps an easy catch-all, and this actually might include maybe several hundred species. So in actual fact, the number of species that we're actually growing and exploring in aquaculture, maybe, maybe two or three times the figures that I've given um, at the top there. Of course, we're pretty intuitive as well. So um, this graph here, for example, shows the number of new, new species that we're exploring and culturing each year. And I've just broke it, broke it down here by the different, the different categories. But the very interesting thing here is it would suggest that over the last five years, we're still exploring the culture of at least seven, uh, seven species every year, which I think is, which is pretty impressive and shows that we are um, very keen to explore new sources of protein, how new animals can be grown in new environments, um, new ways of, of, of meeting protein demands of a growing population, all very interesting. Of course, when you look at the value of, um, of aquaculture, um, it's huge, it's 249 billion. And just to put this in, 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 into perspective, this is actually equivalent to the GDP of um, 59 of the world's smallest economies combined. So it's, it's actually a, a pretty big industry generating a huge amount of income. So, what about the, 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 the um, global population? Well, for 2020, we know that global population is set at around 7.8 billion. We now know that um, just by applying that 4.9% increase in aquaculture, hopefully by the end of this year, the figures should show that we're producing around 129 million tons of aquaculture product. Um, if we think about just 80% of that as being edible, this actually translates into uh, around uh, 13.25 uh, kilos being eaten by each person per year, or 36 grams a day, um, which is equivalent to, if you like, 1.6 small cans of uh, this tinned mackerel. So this tinned mackerel is perhaps only about two or three inches high, uh, but just gives you an indication of how much um, aquaculture product that we're eating each, each year. But of course, this talk is really about um, about diseases, and so I'm going to focus on the diseases here. 
So we know that uh, disease, and I'm going to focus in, in Asia, of course, and we know that disease is perhaps the largest threat and hurdle to the sustainable production um, of aquaculture. So what I would like to do now is really just spend the rest of the talk um, looking at some of these main diseases. As Jan has just said, I'm going to focus on salmon, tilapia, and, and the shrimp industry, and just give you a, a flavor of some of those diseases which are causing um, big impacts. So we've already talked about um, uh, global production, uh, um, moving towards 129 million tons at the end of this year. If you're a visual person, this is actually equivalent to the volume of uh, 349 Empire State Buildings. Um, perhaps if you like to think of it in another way, if you took um, a solid cube that was 505 meters wide, 505 meters high, 505 meters deep, and you fill that with all the aquaculture products, that would give you a good idea of how much we're currently producing. But of course, we know that diseases are probably accounting for around a 30% loss. So you could automatically lose maybe 110, 120 um, Empire State Buildings worth of products, just to, just to put it into a sort of a visual, visual term uh, for, for you. And of course, the economic value of this, we're probably losing around 60 billion uh, US dollars a year due to different diseases. Of course, when we try and unpick some of these diseases, of course, we know for those of us working in aquaculture that there are many different factors that play their part. We know that uh, poor, wa poor water quality um, can sometimes mean it's very difficult to try and untangle some of the true impacts just purely due to the pathogen. And so sometimes trying to create an estimate is actually impossible or, and really what we do have to do is just almost give a best guess, a best estimate based on the information that we have available. So I think that as we go through the talk, I think, I think the reason for showing you this slide is that um, as I go through, through the slides, you'll, you'll, you'll perhaps think that some of the figures are perhaps sensationalist or perhaps overinflated. Um, but actually what I've tried to do is I've actually tried to use um, my best guess, my best estimate based on the figures that are available to us. Another important thing to bear in mind is, is that of course, um, while disease is a constant threat, these figures will fluctuate from year to year and from season to season. And so um, as I show you the leaderboard of diseases later on, what I show you um, are the leaders for this year's uh, premiership of um, pathogens, maybe perhaps a little different for what we see next year. Again, just to talk about different impacts and causes of, of, of disease and losses. So we know that the types and strains of animals that we, that we breed may have different responses um, on tolerances to, um, to disease. They may show different resistances. We may see losses um, in our stocks due to predation, cannibalization, physical damage perhaps through um, um, netting or the way the, the husbandry practices that we have in use. There may be, for example, poor nutrition or severe or suboptimal environmental conditions. And of course, disease is a major, a major player within this list as well. And we know that, for example, from these particular factors that we may have impacts, for example, on growth, food conversion. We may have losses due to the downgrading of different uh, aquatic products due to disease or to the damage that perhaps some, some parasites might do to the skin or uh, bacterial lesions may do to the, to, the, to the flesh products. We may lose fish just through uh, escapees. We may have losses as a, uh, as a consequence, for example, of different management decisions. Perhaps they are delayed to treat, to grade, to harvest. And of course, um, we may also have um, losses during, for example, the normal um, activities that we, that we undertake on a day-to-day -day basis in looking after animals. And for example, we may have losses during uh, grading, vaccination, and treatment events as well. So I think these are all important to, to consider as we go through. So what about the impacts of diseases? Well, I, th I think there are two main categories that we can think about. There are, of course, the unpredictable, those sort of sporadic events that we just cannot plan for. They just pop up, they occur, uh, they can't be planned for. And then, for example, we also have the predictable regular 
uh, challenges that we face from disease. So things like, for example, in the Atlantic salmon industry, we know that there are sea lice, that they're there all the time, and we have to continuous, continuously monitor our stocks, look at the levels of, of lice on our fish, and have treatments. And of course, we can actually begin to factor and manage some of those. So the important thing to say here is that while there may be costs in treating and managing infections, for the predictable infections, there, are, there will also be costs associated with prophylactic treatments and management, trying to protect our stocks to make sure they don't get infected from the different pathogens. So why should we bother to record losses? Um, I know that this, uh, this is a picture from uh, Rayong. It's just a couple of provinces over from where I am now. This was taken just last year. I think it was probably an, an algal bloom that caused the loss and, and death of so many fish, but these kind of event, events are actually quite common. And the reason for showing you this is that we know that disease events are a very common occurrence. And I think it's really important that we do raise um, the issues of economic loss because it's important that we raise um, awareness with governments of the threats that different pathogens pose. Um, we know that um, trying to get people to invest in aquaculture is, is also um, uh, a big business. And sometimes there is a reluctance for investors to invest because they just don't know what the risks are. If they knew what the risks were, then the, perhaps they may be more willing to fund or invest in an industry because they can plan for it. Also, for the same reason, if we, have, if we know what the risks are, then we can also think about our biosecurity and financial preparedness. Again, we can make appropriate planning. And I think in this last point here, this is perhaps the most important point because if farmers are aware, for example, of the risks of, um, of different parasites, then they can plan these and into their contingency plans and into their mitigation planning as well. So I think the first thing is, um, is actually recognizing when there's actually a problem. Um, I've put two nice uh, videos of, of parasites here. So to the left, we have Gyrodactylus, which is a, a monogenetic uh, skin fluke on the fins of tilapia. And then we have Trichodina, which we know is a common protozoan encountered in many uh, hatcheries. Unfortunately, these two parasites are perhaps quite conveniently overlooked. Many farmers know they're there, but some of the losses associated with these are just accepted as perhaps normal practices. And unfortunately, this kind of, um, shall I say, fatalistic acceptance or even ignore, um, ignorance um, or ignoring um, the, the, the impacts of these particular pathogens can have on their stocks may mean that we perhaps hide the true severity of some of these diseases and we don't just appreciate perhaps how important uh, some of these diseases are. Just to give you a quick example, here I looked at uh, production in the hatchery of um, a cluster of four farms in Thailand. We don't have to worry too much about the details here, but I've tried to follow the different batches over a year. So we, here we can see egg production, and these consequently develop into the swim up fry stage. They then go through the monosex stage, and finally through to the one inch post nursery stage. Now, if we begin to break these figures down a little bit and apply some figures, and here, this is the number of eggs each month, and I've put the hatch rate, and then again for survival, I've put the survival rate, which is around 60%, about 48% of, of, of the starting total will survive to the 21-day monosex, and then the perhaps 40% of those will, of the starting number will survive to the po uh, one-inch post-nursery. So you can see we have about a, um, between a 70 and 80% survival at each stage. Just if we start to think about um, uh, putting some numbers to these, and here I've put Thai Bart. Again, please don't worry about these too much, but these are the number of stages that are lost. And if we start to apply these figures to the number of animals lost, then they begin to stack up pretty quickly. So what this actually means for this particular cluster of four um, nurseries, four hatcheries, means that just by ignoring just parasites alone, just those two parasites alone, they're probably losing somewhere in the region of around nine and a half thousand dollars every month. And 
the question is, is this a figure that you really want to ignore? And perhaps, perhaps they don't. So when you start to break these figures down, parasites probably account for a direct 20% of the losses. But of course, we know that some of these, sometimes these parasites also create um, points of entry for viral, bacterial, fungal agents. And so, again, trying to estimate the true impact or the true costs associated to one particular disease becomes quite complicated. I always like this picture. When we talk about biosecurity and, and looking after our stocks, we can see that the road ahead is very simple. We just have to go round the roundabout and straight ahead. But of course, it's human nature to always try and look for shortcuts, to try and make our jobs a little easier. And for this reason, this is possibly why biosecurity has so frequently and commonly failed in the past, because we do try and look for these, for these particular shortcuts. And so as we grow our animals, I think it's always important that we, we do take um, the necess necessary steps to make sure that we do get um, health reports before moving new stock into our systems, onto our sites. Uh, we always try and maintain uh, tight quarantining. We are politely and professionally, shall we say, um, suspicious of the results that we get. And I think it's always important that we conduct our own tests to make sure um, that the animals are free from disease and that the disinfection procedures are of the correct dose and being applied in the right way and that biosecurity is continuously being reviewed. And of course, if we do have any suspicions or are uncertain that we do conduct our own tests to make sure that our animals are healthy. There's also an con important consideration in, for example, in the perils of ignorance. So what you're looking at here, this was a new um, business enterprise. I won't say where, but you can possibly guess where it was in the, in, in, in the world. But this company um, wanted to get involved into aquaculture. And so they installed 2,000 cages, 2,000 cages. Um, they put them 12 deep. They put them extending for several hundred meters in either direction without breaking the cages into blocks. Um, there were fish ponds beyond the tree line. And as we approached the farm, you could, you could smell the dead and rotting, rotting fish, which was a real shame because as a consequence, this particular one single site lost 50,000 tons worth of tilapia, probably valued in the region of around somewhere like 81 million US dollars. And this was just pure ignorance in as much as they thought they could just put, put cages in, stock them with fish, feed them, they could harvest them and make lots of money. If perhaps they had only applied a few aquaculture principles by breaking them into small um, groups, allowing for free water movement around those cages, um, think carefully about their stocking, stocking systems, perhaps the story would have been very different. But this, this is very sad where we see such huge losses. So, so really, I should really kind of launch into my top 100 or my top 40 diseases. The title says, it says here, viral, viral pathogens of fish. For any bacteriologists who are sitting watching this um, particular seminar today, you'll notice that the two images that I've put to the left are not due to viral agents, but I was looking for some juicy pictures just to try and make the story a little bit more engaging, but you can see that these are bacterial diseases. But when we begin to look at some of the viral um, diseases and some of the losses, I'm not gonna go through these in great detail, but you can see that we have, for example, a number of um, diseases here that impact on the sal salmon industry. And you can see, for example, just some of the figures um, that have been associated with year-on-year -year, um, events, but also when we have, for example, notable episodes of disease at certain points in history. So, for example, ISI, the ISA um, outbreak, which caused huge losses in Chile and then later on in the Northern Hemisphere, was put at around one to two um, billion US dollars lost. Just to focus on one particular, perhaps notable um, uh, virus, tilapia lake virus, um, is being discussed by many, many people at the moment. Um, it has uh, the unfortunate name of called uh, syncytial hepatitis of tilapia, but we're going to stick with the term uh, TILV. It's been reported as a mortality mostly in young fish, but I can show you in this next slide 
Um, we went to uh, one site in Asia, again, I won't tell you where, um, where they had 88 cages of um, tilapia being grown. And over a period of just two months, the site had a 57% uh, mortality in their stocks. And unfortunately, what they had is they actually had young fish next to large fish, which were actually being, um, being harvested out. So as soon as the, uh, the large fish were being harvested out and they were losing mortalities to TRV in the large fish, they were immediately stocking with young fish. They were becoming infected within a matter of days. And as, as I said, as a consequence, um, this particular site, just over um, this two month period, lost $26,000 worth um, of stock in this, one, in this one site to TILV. So as we gallop forward and think about perhaps some of the important bacterial pathogens, again, perhaps many of these are, are, are known to you. Um, we know, for example, again, just looking at the salmon industry, we know things like uh, Pix Pix Pixi rickettsia uh, in Chile is uh, posing large problems. We know Eremonas hydrophila is a constant threat and, uh, and results in the loss of stocks all around the world. Um, the picture at the top of the, um, the left of this slide shows a nice fish infected with Streptococcus. Again, we can see Streptococcus is very commonly encountered in the warm season when temperatures go over 30 degrees. And again, losses due to Streptococcus are probably well over 700 million each year. So just focusing very quickly on Streptococcus, um, about 10 years ago, um, there was an estimate suggesting that losses were in the region of around 250 million US, US dollars every year. But if we look at the different um, events due to Streptococcus um, around Asia, we can see that there are some pretty big losses. So for example, the Streptococcus um, result I showed you in the 2000 cage um, site, they lost 81 million. In 2015 in China, there was a massive mortality um, of stock which was put at between 280 to 633 million dollars uh, lost. If we try and apply a figure to try and better understand what the losses are, um, if we just use the figure that, I've, I, that, that, that we have for tilapia in 2015, and if we assume an average mortality of around 7.5%, we know that this is a, a, a probably a real figure. We know here from Thailand, we did a survey we found that most farms lose um, around 20% of their stock in the warm season when temperatures do go over um, uh, 30 degrees. So we can apply perhaps a 7.5% mortality. If we apply lower rates of loss in countries like the Philippines and Bangladesh, where they like to grow a smaller sized fish, then we can perhaps think of some of the losses um, due to um, Streptococcus being in the region of around 430,000 tons. And if we apply an average um, value of $1,657 per ton, then we're probably looking at over $700 million each year lost just due to um, Streptococcus. Moving quickly on to, to parasites. Um, again, just showing you, for example, here, a few um, losses due to parasitic diseases. I must admit that when I prepared this list, I was actually quite shocked to see Argulus, and you can see a little specimen of Argulus there frantically swimming in the middle, and there's an SEM just to the, to, to the left of the slide. In India, the, the, the suggestion is that when you canvas farmers and, and look at the industry, that they lose around 19% of their stock due to Argulus. So if you translate this across the, the entire industry, it translates into losses of, of around 6.4 billion US dollars just due to, to Argulus. When we look at elsewhere, and I know that there are many people listening in, um, to, in today's seminar from Australia and perhaps from Japan, this is a skin fluke that affects cereolids, yellowtail. We know that this parasite costs um, around $400 million a year in, in losses due to the industry. And then we've seen earlier on in today's talk, we've seen things like white spot, trichodina, um, and gyrodactus. We know that they also have their impacts on, on um, notably the production of very young fish. Just to the left here, we've got a picture of a sea louse. We know that the sea lice, um, again, this is one of those constant threats to the industry. 
losses are in the region of around 600 million US dollars every year. So if we prepare, if you like, our leaderboard um, of just looking at some of the main um, diseases impacting on fish production, it might look something like this. Um, of course, you'll notice there are some perhaps notable emissions. So for example, I, I, as I prepared this slide, I realized I hadn't added in nodavirus. So nodavirus might be in the region of around $18 million each year loss. And of course, as I said earlier on, this, this um, shall we say, leader table of diseases will change from season to season, crop to crop, year to year, region to region. And so trying to create a leaderboard of diseases is perhaps a little bit more challenging um, than it first seems. Um, if we look at the mollusk industry, we can see, for example, these are perhaps some of the, the, the main pathogens impacting on the culture of mollusks around the world. And again, if we look at crustacean diseases, so for example, you can see there AHP and D, Vibrio parahemolyticus, right at the very top. We know that's perhaps the top bacterial disease. And then we have white spot syndrome virus. We know that this is the, the main virus um, pathogen impacting on crustaceans. And then just third from the bottom there, you can see Enterocytosur and Hepatopenae. This is, a, this is a pathogen that's moving very quickly up the list. This is a parasite that, a microsporidium parasite that infects the hepatopancreas of shrimp. And this is also having a huge impact on the cultured um, white leg shrimp industry. And I can show you um, some of this in some of, in some of the next few slides I'm going to show you. Of course, just over the course of the last two months, we've heard the appearance of some new diseases. We've, we've heard of DIV1 or Decapod irid, um, iridiovirus. It was formerly called uh, CQIV or um, SHIV, which um, shrimp hemocyte iridescent virus. It's actually the same name. And then just recently, we've also heard about HPTV coming from China. So we have to look very carefully at perhaps what are the costs and the impacts of some of these pathogens to those particular industries. Just to show you how common disease is, this is, this is a picture from my, uh, a pond on my, on my wife's farm. Uh, if, you, if you suddenly notice the gentleman just to the right of your screen, don't worry, you're not witnessing a drowning event. This, this gentleman is actually is, is, is well and good and still part of the family. But what I really wanted to show in this particular slide here was that, um, oops, sorry, if I just go back one. If, I, if you can see in this particular slide here, sorry, it's jumping forward. Um, I'm just focusing on shrimp and tilapia diseases. Anything in yellow hasn't been recorded um, for that particular country. Anything in, in blue has been recorded in the last five years. And anything in, I think it's the red color, has been recorded in the country, but, but perhaps not so for the last five years. And of course, this board is always changing. It has to be cons constantly updated. And the reason for showing you this is just to show you that there's a lot of diseases around imp impacting on production. So what I'd really like to do now, just the last few minutes of today's talk, is really just have a quick focus on some of the shrimp industry. And if we look at the shrimp production over the last 50 years, and you can see this is both uh, world production and Asia production. And here I'm looking at the percentage increase or reduction from year to year. So for, for, for 1970, you can see there was perhaps, or should I say in 1971, there was almost a 30% increase in production over what was produced in 1970. So by doing this, we can actually follow, if you like, the, 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 the fortunes or uh, challenges to the shrimp industry over the last 50 years. So you can see in the mid, um, mid 80s and mid 90s, a number of serious challenges, mostly from viruses, from yellowhead, from Tara syndrome virus and white spot virus. But perhaps the most challenging period that we're going through at the moment is at the moment where we've had AHP and D and EHP, that enterocytosurin hepatopenae, uh, where you can see that actually the production has gone into um, negative, shall we say, negative growth. Just to show you um, this quite clearly, um, here I'm going to focus on, um, first of all, on AHP and D. This is a, a disease caused by Vibrio parahemolyticus, but pathogenic isolates, which have a plasmid, which um, codes for a, or has a, uh, a peer toxin releasing gene. And what happens is that shrimp get infected very, very quickly. You can see the hepatopancreas 
here in the middle has changed from a dark color to a light color. We get um, mortalities occurring very, very quickly. It's sometimes called early mortality syndrome because farmers tend to see this in the first 30 to 40 days of stocking their ponds. Mortalities happen very, very quickly. But of course, we shouldn't really use the term early mortality syndrome because early mortality can, can be due to many different factors. But when they do talk about it, in most cases, they're actually talking about AHP and D. So when we look at the um, hepatopancreas of these, perhaps we might see, for example, dark tubules that are infected by, um, um, by, by Vibrio infections. I'm also going to talk in the next couple of slides about EHP, this microsporidium, just to show you a few images of how they look here. They also infect the hepatopancreas. And of course, I want to talk very quickly about white spot virus as well through this project that we're running at the moment. So the reason that AHP and D is perhaps on the leaderboard of the shrimp diseases at the moment is because I'm going to focus on this yellow line in the middle of the graph here. In 2010, Thailand was producing close to 600,000 tons worth of white leg shrimp. But that very quickly dropped to around 189,000 tons. They lost 400,000 tons worth of production after AHP and D was introduced into the country. Um, and just to show you how that translates, that was around 7.9 billion, that's billion, uh, lost between 2010 to 2016, due, just due to infections. You can also see some of the impacts in other countries. It wasn't just only Thailand. When we look, for example, just to show you the impact that this had on the Thai industry, this is the number of six metric ton containers passing through each day in Thailand's main uh, seafood market in Mahachai. And I don't need to put a line through this, but you can see that the number of containers passing through over the subsequent years has fallen quite dramatically. I can show you this you, um, quite clearly just by plotting it year by year. And then if I group them, so the top line, the blue line there, shows you the number of containers on average passing through um, between 2010 to 2012. And then after AHP and D was introduced, the red line at the bottom there just shows you how much production has dropped. We can look at this in a perhaps a more complicated way. And I know sometimes that perhaps the estimates have been conducted very simply, but we can also do it more complicated. So if we look at the value of the shrimp passing through the markets each day, the size of the shrimp, do all the, um, shall we say, calculated complica um, and complicated calculations, then actually we come to a very similar figure. So doing it the simple way, we get 7.9 billion lost. Doing it the highly complicated way, we get a loss of around 7.4 billion. Of course, this is only the losses on the farm. It also doesn't take account of, for example, losses due to feed sales and export value. So if we add those in as well, then we're probably looking at around $11 billion lost just to the Thai industry alone. When we look at it on, uh, on a, on a country-wide um, level, so the first map here just shows you um, the percentage change in farms, um, both before and after the HP and d um, outbreak. The blacker the color, the more serious was the impact in that particular region. The second map shows you the amount of land, change in land being used to grow shrimp. And of course, this last one, um, third map, shows you the change in tonnage. I had to change the colors here, otherwise it would all be black, just because they lost 400,000 tons in a very short period. Of course, when we do do our calculations, um, sometimes we just have to very conveniently lump diseases together. Um, it's not because we're trying to be sensationalist. It's just that when you start thinking about the number of animals involved. So if we just take, for example, the numbers of shrimp that we lose um, in, in the shrimp industry each year, it's around three and a half billion shrimp. And if we spent just one minute trying to diagnose the precise cause of loss in each of those shrimp, then it would take us 6.6 .6 million years. So it just shows you the enormity of some of the, some of the challenges are, that we are facing. And so we do sometimes just to have to very conveniently lump losses due to the main pathogen acting at that particular time. When we look at white spot, again, we, we've been able to get some very nice um, detailed data from places like the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. We've looked at, for example, uh, 
losses in the percentage of ponds in different, in different districts, both for tiger and for white leg shrimp. We can then use all those figures and um, looking at local feed rates, labor rates, electricity, uh, a variety of different factors, we can actually move to some quite close estimates of what we hope is the true estimate of loss in those particular regions. So just for white spot losses in the Mekong Delta for 2015, for Monodon tiger shrimp, it was in the region of around 2.3 million. For Vanamai, it was around 5.6 million. So again, we have challenges, not just only looking on a global scale, but also on a country scale and on a more local scale as well. So just quickly rattling towards the end now, I also want to introduce um, Entrocytozoa and Hepatopenae. This is the microsporidian parasite inside um, um, the hepatopancreas of shrimp. Um, just the top image there just shows a swollen tail from a, from a shrimp. When we first pick up our shrimp and have a look, the swollen tips on the end of the tail here suggest that maybe our shrimp is not healthy. It's maybe suffering from a systemic bacteriology or ba a bacterial disease. It's the first hint that we have. When we start looking at the gut, if we see that the gut is very dark, lots of chromatophores, again, this indicates an animal under stress. When we look at the hepatopancreas, we might see, for example, um, uh, misshaped tubules. Here we can see some very dark tubules suggesting they have a vibrio infection. And then when we start to look inside the hepatopancreas and inside the intestine, we might be able to begin to see, for example, some spores. So the actual back image that you're seeing to this slide here is, is a huge mass of spores inside the gut of one of these shrimp. Trying to estimate the losses due to this particular disease is also very, very complicated because it doesn't really kill shrimp. What actually happens is when shrimp get infected, it actually causes the, the growth of the shrimp to arrest. So all these shrimp that you can see here in the middle of the slide, all of these have been taken from just one pond. And you can see there's a huge size range in some of these shrimp. When we work with the farm, so we've been working with um, 115 farms this last year, we've sampled close to 500 ponds, both both earth ponds, semi-lined ponds, and fully lined ponds, it seems that EHP now appears to be everywhere. At the first half of last year, we were looking at around 60 to 70 percent of ponds being infected. Today, it's perhaps closer to 90, 95 percent of those ponds are being infected. We're working with um, farmers, the farming industry, um, processes trying to estimate the losses of this, but it's, it's hideously complicated when we have this very sort of insidious effects on, on the production. But my best guess at the moment is $180 million lost just to the Thai white leg industry. Um, if, I, if I have the opportunity to give another talk um, next year, perhaps, or later this year, I might be able to give you a revised figure as we're currently going through this at the moment. So moving to the end of the, of the talk, um, if, we can, if we prepare perhaps our 40 top diseases so far, it might look something like this. As I said, um, this does change from season to season, year to year, crop to crop. Um, there are some extra diseases that we need to add as they appear. So for example, the um, nodovirus isn't listed here. But I think we have to be very cautious in actually how we translate and interpret some of these diseases because we have to make sure that what we do present, I think, is, is appropriately balanced. So as a last slide, I think it's, um, there's always a plea for data. Getting hold of good quality data is always, always very, very difficult. If we can get good data, then hopefully we can begin to move closer to some of these um, estimates of loss, some of the impacts. Hopefully we can help drive certain industries for improvements to address some of these pathogens, hopefully improving animal welfare and codes of practice and hopefully by having these transparent so just in just in closing i'd just like to say thank you very much everyone for today's talk thank you very much for listening thanks so much for that andy we had a a little technical uh, hiccup at the end there and, and lost your talk. You, I know that you said at the start there, there was, um, you've got some big storms where you are at the moment. So perhaps that's contributed. Um, we, we I'd ask, 
ask so anyone who has any questions to write that in the Q&A and um, uh, I'm sure Andy will uh, take a few, has a few minutes hopefully to, to answer any questions that anyone might have. Sure. At what point did you lose the talk, just out of interest? At the very end, Andy, okay. just at the very end, there was a, sl a slight lag in some of okay. your slides, um, okay. but just at the very, very um, last moment. I think the last slide was just a shameless plea for data. Good quality data is always, <laughs> always needed uh, to try and help to move to good estimates, to try and help um, drive for improvements in the industry, raise awareness with uh, governments, help investors, help farmers, um, yeah, and just try and drive the sustainability of, of agriculture forward. Okay, thank you. We've got a question from Dean Jerry, and Professor Jerry asks, how do we get industry to take the disease threat seriously and follow basic biosecurity? That, 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 that is a, that's a great question, Dean. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, it, 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 it is a constant challenge, and I, th and I, and I think... Um, I showed you that uh, image of the, of the roundabout and people taking shortcuts. And it seems that um, biosecurity does continuously have to be reviewed. When we, when we do it on a farm level, it seems to work well for a couple of crops. And then we have a kind of a short term memory or a, or a myopia, I'm not sure which, is, which it is. And we forget um, the importance of those biosecurity issues. Um, I think we cannot ignore, for example, the magnitude of some of these losses. So, for example, taking EHP at the end there um, is a very good point uh, in case. Um, the government is working hard with the industry to try and make sure that the um, recommendations that it makes for farmers are the best they are. But sometimes we need to make sure that they're being implemented properly on the farm. And sometimes it's not just a case of applying um, the treatment, but we also have to think about organic loading or other environmental factors that perhaps might reduce the efficacy of those treatments. So I think that um, we do need to raise the issue with governments, but then we, then we need to work hand in hand with those governments, uh, governments to, make, to make sure that the practices on the farm are appropriate and are being implemented and that they help try and reduce the magnitude of some of these diseases. I probably didn't answer your question, Dean, but it, it, it is a challenge working with governments. Hey Andy, we have a few more questions. Here's one from Jose Domingos and Joe asks, what could you share with us in, in terms of the impacts of COVID to the industry in Asia? Great question. Again, thank you very, thank you very much, Jose. So yes, there, there, are, there are a variety of, of different impacts and I'm sure you've been following those. So for example, when COVID first broke out, there was a reluctance by many farmers to, to, um, to stock their ponds. Um, that was twofold. One, one they, they were not sure whether they would get the seed um, or the juveniles to put into their ponds. Uh, another impact, they were concerned about whether they would have the appropriate supplies um, through the production chain to make sure they had feed. They were also worried about making sure that their farmers uh, were healthy and able to work on site. As we look at some of the figures, there was also a little bit of panic, panic um, harvesting. Uh, some farmers were worried that if um, there were impacts to processing plants that many would shut. And so um, a lot of farmers perhaps um, harvested prematurely just to try and get um, to make sure they got some uh, return on their investments. So when you look at the figures, there was actually a, a glut, uh, a large wave of product coming into the processes. As a consequence, the shrimp price then crashed. Um, not only shrimp, I should say, is, is happening in other aquaculture industries as well. Um, we have, um, that's all the kind of, those are all the kind of negative things. So there has been a little hesitancy to, to return to restock. For some industries where we have um, long crop cycles, for example, things like salmon, perhaps they're not so, not so hard hit. Um, those are the kind of negative points. On the more positive points, um, we are beginning to see, for example, an increase in domestic consumption of aquaculture product. So um, I know that some of the first cases that were reported uh, were among workers working in seafood markets, but it's been, it's been disproven that there's no link between COVID and the seafood. And so there was a very important paper that was published just recently uh, dispelling that myth. But what we have seen is that uh, people are recognizing that in the period of COVID, the benefits of eating seafood, hopefully getting, uh, it's a good nutritious product, um, rich in, um, all the, all the right uh, uh, 
lipids and nutrients. So we've seen a lot of the convenience foods for, for, for seafood increasing, but also we've seen a lot of industries beginning, uh, for example, these motorbike uh, door to door, or should I say from, from farm to door delivery of aquatic products as well. Thanks, Andy. We've got a few more questions. Pauline Nalves uh, uh, states, thanks, Andy, great talk. What is, in your opinion, the best way to reduce, eliminate these diseases? Do you think that biocontrol, such as cleaner fish or cleaner shrimp, could be an option to reduce parasitic infection? Another good, another good question. I think that's, uh, it, it's actually a more complicated one to answer. Uh, that's why it's such a good question. And I think we have to take every, every industry and, and every situation case by case. Um, so um, with things like cleaner fish, we have seen, for example, some um, um, effective removal of things like lice and ectoparasites. I know that there's a very strong team that's been in JCU um, look, looking at this and elsewhere, um, um, looking at the performance of, of cleaner fish. Um, there are some welfare concerns that have been voiced in um, um, the Northern Hemisphere with regard to cleaner fish, but again, they're moving uh, to work closely with those industries to make sure that the cleaner fish are the, are the best um, they can be in terms of their uh, welfare provi provision for those. But I, but I really think it's, it, there's no simple answer to that, but I think we have to take it a case by case. So we have a, another question um, by Kate Hudson. Hi Kate. Kate says, hi Andy, do you see vaccine development playing a major role uh, in pathogen prevention and in the long-term parasitic infection? Or do you think exclusion is plausible through technological developments? Wow, great. Well, I, I, I suppose when you look at, hi Kate, it's nice to, <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, there's a lot of activity in, in, in the vaccine space. Um, lot, lots of work uh, going, um, being invested into um, notably bacterial and viral, viral agents in the Mediterranean, in Asia, and in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we have seen, um, for some of the larger parasites, we have seen a whole suite of different, um, very creative technological innovations, um, including, for example, things like complete exclusion. So for example, in the salmon industry, we now have things like the egg um, and the, the, the farm and the snorkel, and where basically uh, the, the fish are cultured inside almost, if you like, a a complete bag, but the, the animal can still do its, its normal, normal things, but it means that it try and keeps uh, the infective stages out. Um, we've also seen, for example, um, the use of some crazy technology. I, I, I should say, I should be a bit more respectful in the term crazy, but with things like lasers um, and, and other mechanical means to, to try and remove, um, remove parasites. There's a lot of work going on in, on in those. There was a paper just published this week looking at the performance efficacies of some of those. We have a lot of treatments now moving, for example, into well boats so that we don't do treatments in the sea anymore, but we do them inside the boats. And then the chemical is, is chemically stripped out again to make sure that we don't have any impacts on, on the environment. So I think in terms of a, of a balanced portfolio of, of integrated pest management, there is, a, there is a place for, for a variety of these different techniques in tackling different diseases. Again, a huge complicated one to answer with just a simple answer, but thank you, Kate, for that. Okay, Andy, we have a few more questions if you have the time to, to answer. Um, Hatem Al Basri is from the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. And he states, currently Northern Bali sea cages are experiencing sea lice parasitic disease. What can cause this parasitic disease? The mariculture net cage is located in a relatively open area. Okay, well, I think the first thing, to, it depends on which, um, I, I assume it's probably a Caligus um, parasite that's impacting uh, on the fish. But again, we would just need to have a look at that. These are quite, you ubiquitous, they're everywhere in the marine environment, but of course once you, you get um, the interaction between wild fish moving in around cages where there may be um, a, a better availability of food, there is a very easy transfer of the parasites from the wild fish 
onto the cage stock. And then once you have the cage stock, it's very easy for that parasite to proliferate. Um, there's a very good history of um, a whole number of different methods being tried um, and tested in the Northern Hemisphere, in Chile as well, um, and also um, down in Tasmania in dealing with different sea lice infections. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, they now have mandatory um, counts of lice every week, taking a small number of fish from the cages, uh, just to monitor levels, trying to make sure that those lice don't cause huge impacts to, to the fish, and then treating when, when necessary. The, the, the Canadians, the Norwegians, the Scots, the, a number of countries all have these um, um, area management programs now where, where if you have a large number of farms in a particular site, they actually coordinate treatments together. And the idea is that by treating together, they can actually cause um, huge depressions or completely remove uh, parasites from a particular region. And as a consequence of this, it means that the individual farmer then has to do less treatments each year. Um, but again, if you would like to um, uh, make contact afterwards, I would love to learn a little bit more about the kind of parasites that you have there. And then let's try and look and see if we can um, see how we might be able to address those. Uh, a couple more, if, if you will, Andy. Ellen Ariel asks, I noticed that you only registered the edible part of the production of aquaculture products at around 80%. Has the inedible parts of, for example, chickens, eggs and cattle already been considered? Um, from the figures that I used, my, my understanding was that was the, that was the edible, edible portion. But I, the reason I wanted to, to put that particular slide up was because um, sometimes perhaps the figures are perhaps being, I think we need to look at the figures a little bit more closely. Um, it's not just about the meat, but when we, when, we take the, when we take the aquaculture product, we're taking the whole thing. The one thing within aquaculture, the, the, the figure there that showed over 600 species shows that we have a huge and very varied um, number of industries that we're working with. Um, FAO does provide some pretty, pretty good databases. It takes them a couple of years to update, but again, it's really important that the edible portion is always, always factored in. So I showed 80%, which I think was probably perhaps wildly optimistic, um, but, it, but it is well worth looking very closely um, at these figures when we compare industry, different industries. I didn't really answer your question, but it's, it's, it, is a, it is an important consideration. Okay, just a couple more. Thanks, Andy. So Sandra Infante Villamel asks, what new strategies in health management are being applied in aquaculture in Asia? Are there any successful cases of probiotics? Pro probiotics? Uh, yes, probi probi probiotics are, are being used very extensively in Asia. Um, I think just, just picking the white leg shrimp industry as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a particular example. So we've seen it's a very progressive industry. So we've seen uh, farmers moving from earthen ponds to fully lined ponds. We now see them installing um, shrimp toilets and looking at uh, sludge maps and positioning aerators to make sure we get effective movements of the, of the bottom and that the bottom is, main, is, is, is kept clean and maintained. And the idea about this is that uh, feces and uneaten food and perhaps spores where spores of different parasites might, might accumulate are periodically uh, or regularly flushed and removed from the system. Um, with um, pro probiotics, again, I'm not a probiotics person, but I can, I can refer you to a, to a person who, who specializes in that. Again, it's all about promoting the health of these animals. We've seen farmers that do have um, AHP and D and white spot and have been living with it for many years. And just through very careful management of their stocking, their feed, their, the health of the animals, the water quality, they're able to nurse um, part of their crop through its cycle and still return a profit on their crops. So um, yes, probiotics are being very widely used in Asia. And uh, a final question, Andy, from QN QN Bar. And QQ asks, thanks, well, she states, thanks for the useful and interesting talk. Uh, what's your opinion on selective breeding programs for specific uh, pathogen resistance? Or should the breeding uh, focus 
um, more on producing robust animals in general? Another, another great question. Um, and I, I, sh I, I don't know if I mentioned it right at the beginning, but, but I, while, while disease is one of the challenges, um, genetics and breeding, problem, uh, uh, breeding programs are actually one, one of the solutions. So we are, we are um, seeing a number of different players um, uh, in the industry. And we've seen, for example, in shrimp, sorry to keep talking about shrimp, but it's also in tilapia and salmon and, and, and a lot of industries where we've, where we've seen um, the, the industry drive very positively, for example, for um, things like AHP, AHP and D white spot virus and IHHMV resistant, resistant, or should we say tolerant lines to, to, to different diseases. So um, it definitely, definitely has their, it definitely has a place. And again, it forms part of a robust, shall we say one health program of trying to, trying to tackle disease. Okay, thanks so much, Andy. That's all the questions uh, that we have there. But um, uh, thank you so much for your time and effort and uh, th thanks for presenting to us. Um, thanks to everyone in Australia and uh, also internationally for joining. And um, we uh, hope you enjoyed Andy's talk. I'm sure that you did. And uh, thanks for uh, linking into our CSTFA seminar series. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Great. Thanks so much for that, Andy. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. That was, that was very kind of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And um, I uh, hope all, um, all goes well for you in uh, this, this crazy COVID time. Thank, thank you. I, I hope I answered those questions. Uh, I, I, they're great. Some great questions and some of those are quite, quite huge to try and answer. But um, if there's, a, if there's there any, um, um, subsequent questions, do feel free to, to ping them across. I will. Thank you, Andy. Now, yeah, and, and uh, we'll be in touch. And if I get through some additional questions, I'll let you know. Lovely. Thank you. Very, thank you. Very, and I'm sorry you had to chase me right at the end there. <laughs> oh, no, it's all, it's all right. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, be in touch. Thanks, Andy. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.